Like, I hope somebody gets his IP, doxes him, swats him, fucks his mother in front of his face. Like, I literally hope that his fucking house blows up and everybody in his family tree dies and he can't reproduce. Fuck that kid. I literally want that dude's personal information so I can go to his house and fucking strangle him in front of his parents. The right to vote. You ever hear that one? Illegal alien has the right to vote. There's a town in California where they actually tried to take over the town council. All illegal aliens running the town council. That sounds like a great idea. Part 1. What is Stochastic Terrorism? In the 2011 blog post called Stochastic Terrorism Part 1, Triggering the Shooters, an author by the alias of G2G coined the titular phrase to describe the phenomenon of lone wolf actors being influenced by high-profile public figures. As G2G describes it, Stochastic terrorism is the use of mass communications to incite random actors to carry out violent or terrorist acts that are statistically predictable but individually unpredictable. In short, remote control murder by lone wolf. Put another way, a stochastic terrorist is someone who is responsible for the situation or incident. They use mass media, such as radio, television, and various internet channels, to rile up their audience and inspire hatred towards a particular person or a group of people. The lone wolf is the person who actually commits the crime. They respond to the stochastic terrorist rhetoric by committing a terrorist or violent act against the person or people being targeted. This person's actions might have been statistically predictable, as the definition describes, but the specific person and their act were not. The plausible deniability then rises from the stochastic terrorist. They were just a sick individual, nobody could have thought this would happen, I'm not responsible for what they did. And that last bit in particular, refusing accountability, is what keeps the stochastic terrorist in their job, while the lone wolf gets captured or killed. But how does it get to that point? Part 2. Parasocial Relationships YouTuber Shannon Strucky made an amazing set of videos on the nature of parasocial relationships, which I highly recommend checking out if you haven't already seen them. For the purposes of this video, we're going to define parasocial relationships as such. A parasocial relationship is one in which there's a perceived one-to-one -one relationship with a high-profile status figure, whether it's a YouTuber, Twitter user, celebrity, political figure, and so on, and a spectator. This relationship is illusionary, but the spectator invests time and effort into it as they would any other relationship. In other words, this is a one-sided relationship for the spectator. The high-profile figure is unaware of their feelings and might not even know that the specific spectator exists, but their content is such that it connects with the spectator in a way that they might with a close friend or a relative. Parasocial relationships are nothing new and can be a source of good for some people. A 2017 NOVA article called The Parasocial Phenomenon spends some time discussing the ways in which they can be beneficial. For example, they can help people with low self-esteem be more comfortable in their skin. It removes the awkwardness or anxiety of being present in certain social situations. And there's little to no risk, which can be beneficial to people who are afraid of rejection. On the other hand, parasocial relationships can become a crutch. Intimate though it might be, a parasocial relationship just doesn't provide the same social fulfillment as being and interacting with loved ones. Parasocial relationships are prime ways for advertisers to connect with potential customers. So for example, if a YouTuber is sponsored by a particular brand, the spectator might be more inclined to purchase from that brand if there is an invested parasocial relationship. And a person might develop unhealthy, unrealistic ways of socializing with people off screen. The trouble arises when the spectator turns into the lone wolf. Part 3. Coaching. When a parasocial relationship forms, the heart of it is the sense of perceived intimacy between the figure and the spectator. When this illusionary intimacy is cultivated, the parasocial relationship grows, especially when the figure continually refers and addresses the spectator as a sort of third party between the spectator, the figure, and the medium that the figure uses. Hi guys. Hey guys. Hi guys. Hi guys. Hey guys.
Hi guys. Hi guys. Hi guys. Your typical YouTube video or other means of mass communication generally consists of a face-to-face -face interaction. The space is already highly intimate. You only get this close to people who you're friendly with or in love with. It primes the audience to establish trust in the figure. As spectators connect and continue to watch or interact with the figure, the spectators develop a sense of the kind of culture, ideals, and values that the figure has, as well as the kind of support to give them. The audience is primed again via friends or associates of the figure who act in ways that are deferential or subordinate to the figure. In essence, this is how spectators should react while watching the figure. Adding to this, a sort of positive propaganda stems from the figure to their PR reps, their friends, their platforms, people that might host them, people that they might host, and so on. The idea here is that the figure should be admired, respected, and loved by the spectator. Early researchers on parasocial relationships, Horton and Wool, described this as an illusion of reciprocity via a cultivated rapport with the spectator. All of this is to say that these increase sympathy and intimacy towards the high-profile figure. When this so-called friendship is cultivated, it's also seen as credible, and it makes sense to help your friends. So, arguably, the appropriate way for the spectator to respond is to use the familiarity they perceive to have with the figure to assist the figure in any way possible. If you're thinking, hey, this kind of sounds like a cult, in a sense you'd be right. This is a form of coaching attitudes towards the figure. Now, the figure might or might not know that they're responsible for it, but it still happens, often to their benefit. How many times have you or your friends and loved ones said, I like this person because they're real. They tell it like it is. They're so sincere. He's so warm and funny. She has so much heart about a person you watch or interact with online, but don't really know. These are sympathetic images that the figure needs you to cultivate in order for them to continue to have that rapport with you. Now, it should be noted that not every figure who does this is maliciously doing so, or is lying, or is trying to scam you. Many, many people do this, but it's important to be aware of it. What we consume shapes our thoughts and beliefs in a very real way, but it should be noted again, that it is a common tactic seen in people who are a stochastic terrorist. Part 4. The Lone Wolf Back to G2G. At any given time, there are hundreds of thousands of Americans with combinations of personality characteristics, such as emotional instability, a paranoid ideology, and a propensity for violence, that put them at risk of going off the deep end and becoming lone wolves. All it takes is the right push, the right nudge at the right time to dislodge a few of them and send them on their way to 15 minutes of fame surrounded by dead bodies. So we know what a parasocial relationship is. We know how people are primed and coached to be sympathetic towards figures. There's one thing left, tipping the scale. Consider YouTube figures such as Steven Crowder, Paul Joseph Watson, Stephen Molyneux, Sargon of Akkad, and others. If you don't take them seriously, we can look at political figures, Sean Hannity, Rush Limbaugh, Donald Trump. Many people who watch these and other figures are emotionally or mentally unstable, and make no mistake, the figures are aware of it. They know the details of their audience demographics due to research and analytics, they often share the same social media platforms or forums, and they coach their audience to share the same values and ideals as them. Now, this doesn't just apply to prominent alt-right figures, this can be anybody. When we're talking about specifically YouTube, other figures such as Keemstar and PewDiePie might not be directly alt-right themselves, but have had highly volatile pasts involving racism. What a fucking nigger. Jeez, oh my god, what the fuck? This dude is so embarrassed that he's black. Look at this reaction I'm getting. He's so angry because he knows he's a fucking second class citizen. But the only reason why you want to fuck a white chick is because nobody wants to fuck a black chick. Off chink, it's okay for me to call you this because racism is power plus prejudice. Doxing. All right, his Skype is literally smile for YouTube. Oh, uh, here we go. All right, this is his phone number. Oh my fucking God. And they're saying 517 Clover yeah. Ave. That's, it's no. Province. That's the wrong province. Like, the guy's from Canada. This is his wife's phone number right here to her business. And pandering to white nationalist views. YouTube lets me 
to combat clickbait, edit anyone's titles on YouTube. And you know who cares more about clickbait than anyone? Oh, you guessed it again. This guy. I don't know if she voted, if she's a woman from Quebec, she probably did vote for the Liberals. Maybe the Conservatives would have been better at shutting down the border earlier. You know, one of the things that characterizes Conservatives is a revulsion to the unclean. It's actually been kind of measured psychologically. A, a greater horror of the unclean and so on. It's R versus K selected, as I've talked about before on this show. When these and other figures produce content that involves repeated alt-right or dangerous rhetoric, they're not looking to change minds. They're purposely playing to their base that, to be clear, they know includes people who are unstable. Repetition reinforces rhetoric. And so it goes that when you push unstable people into forming a parasocial relationship with malicious figures, the results tend to speak for themselves. Jews will not replace us! Jews will not replace us! Jews will not replace us! There has been a shooting at a synagogue in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Just moments ago, police reporting there are multiple casualties with three officers shot. The suspect is in custody. This all happening at the Tree of Life Synagogue in the area of Wilkins and Shady Avenues in Pittsburgh's Squirrel Hill neighborhood. Multiple law enforcement agencies now responding. Police are telling- A gunman with an automatic weapon has opened fire on a mosque in central Christchurch. We are on standby for a statement from the Prime Minister at 4 o'clock. Elliot Rogers' mass murder plot had come together over the course of the past year. All of it detailed in a chilling manifesto and disturbing video that he left behind. We have watching Dr. George Tiller. Today he took the stand in his own defense. He came to tonight's law marks. Joins us now with his testimony. Kelly and Larry, Rotter's testimony is straightforward. It is non-apologetic and non-emotional. But the case inside the court is about this video from Saturday where police say Fields slammed his car into shooting protesters and two stop vehicles, killing one and injuring at least 19. When this spectator turned lone wolf is captured, some attention is paid to their history with the figure. However, focus then shifts to their take on the figure's rhetoric. Discussions will veer away from the figure to the lone wolf, and the figure now has plausible deniability. Yesterday on stream you said for four years Keemstar's been sending people to, to attack me and harass me. False. Show proof. Show the proof of me sending anyone to attack you. It's just a blanket lie. When you have 90 million people riled up about something, you're bound to get a few degenerates. And it started off with someone spray painting sub to PewDiePie on a World War II memorial. And just so disgusting, so disappointing to have my name and community uh, dragged into that. But then something happened that I don't think anyone would have predicted the Christchurch shooter said subscribe to PewDiePie. To have my name associated to, with something so unspeakably vile has affected me in more ways than I let shown because I, I don't think it has anything to do with me. It's important to recognize that although I'm speaking in theory, continued repetition of these events speak for themselves. Violence doesn't exist in a vacuum. Violence, like fire, requires fuel and a spark. Exploring the connection between parasocial relationships and stochastic terrorism provides some insight into understanding why these attacks happen. Even harmless rhetoric shapes our thoughts and values, for better or for worse. It's important to really examine how media can influence people and to cultivate a sense of literacy into what we consume. Without analyzing how these figures can influence these spectators, the attacks will continue to happen unchecked and unexamined. The lone wolf absolutely pulled the trigger, but the figure primed them too. All they needed was a little push.